Job chapter 1, um, starting in verse 8. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for not? For hast thou not made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Okay, and um, let's go to First uh, Peter chapter 1. Yeah. I'm going to be flipping a little bit, but we're going to end up at one place. Sit on that for a while. Um, 1 Peter 1 5 says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And then uh, you don't have to do all this flipping, you can just sit on the board. I think. Isaiah 43 1 says this, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Thou art mine. And then in Zechariah 2.8 says, for, this, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. He that touches you touches the apple of his eye. And what is the apple of God's eye? Right? He that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Pastor Chevelli preached over in Poland about this um, in a message, and he was saying that <clears throat> the apple of God's eye refers to a little child. Right? It's uh, in reference to a little boy or a little girl. Right? So here we are, we're all ancient people, a lot of us today, but in God's eyes, we are little boys and little girls, right? Um, see the little kids running around here? Everybody thinks they're so cute and all that, and they are. And this is how we are in God's eyes. And he that touches you touches the apple of his eye, those little children. That's what it's like with God, how we are with God. We are like little children um, in his eyes, and that's how he treats us. You know the story of the prodigal, when he uh, took all his uh, inheritance and wasted it on riotous living, and if you ever look up what riotous living is, it wasn't good. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I think I'll go to a local pub and have a few beers. No, he was doing everything to excess, like in, in uh, uh, when Solomon said, whatever there was under the sun, I did it. I wanted to see what and experience everything, and he did it. And so that's what he did, riotous living. And the, whatever sin there was, and he had the money to do it, he did it. And then he came to himself, you know the story, and he went back and wanted to just be his father's servant. Well, and the father put the robe on, the ring, and all that, because that was his heart for his son, right? So, you're my son, and that, that was his heart. Mm -hmm. So, he that touches you, touches the apple of his eye. That's, that's who you are. Five times in the scriptures, God talks about the apple of his eye, and that's who we are. And you can say, I don't feel like the apple of his eye. I'm a wicked person. I've done this, I've done that. I can't be the apple of his eye, but you are. Because in Isaiah 43, it says, you are mine. You are mine. I have redeemed you. So, I have redeemed you. Have you been redeemed this morning? Uh, if you can say yes to that question, you are his. You belong to him. You were bought with a price. You are his, and he looks at you as the apple of his eye. And in 1 Peter, when it says that we are kept by the power of God, that's what we are kept by. That power of God that God has said and God has determined and God has declared. In Song of Solomon, um, the woman says of, of, um, of uh, the king, he has brought me into his banqueting house, right? And his banner over me was love. 
And the banner there is his declaration. So he brings me to the banquet house, a place of feasting. And he puts a declaration over her. And that woman represents you and I in Christ, by the way, in Scripture. Uh, and the banner he puts over her is a banner of love. Because you are mine. Because you are the apple of my eye. And it has nothing to do with how you feel about it at all. Or whether you deserve it at all. Or whether you have earned it at all. You don't earn this, it's just given to you. A child, these children that have been running around here, they don't, they're not looking and saying, well, how can I earn my daddy's love today? Or my mommy's love? Or my grandfather's love? No, they're just being little children. And you, they are the apple of their eyes. These little children. And this is how we are in God's eyes. And nobody can touch us. You know, that story about Job wasn't just for Job. That wasn't just for Job. That's, that we relate to that. We read Job because we're going through horrible affliction and suffering. And we say, oh, well, I feel like Job today. Well, if you really felt like Job today, you would know that God did put a hedge around you. Mm-hmm. That God has encircled you. That's what it says. On every side, Satan said to God. Satan was jealous of what Job had. On every side, God was blessing Job. On every side, he circled him. He circled around him. He came up behind him. He went before him, below him, and above him. And because he was the apple of his eyes. And that's why he said to Satan, have you considered, he could have said easily, have you considered the apple of my eye, my little child Job? And we're not going to go into the rest of the story. We know it. Um... And Job never cursed God to his face. But this was God bragging on him. And he does the same with us. And he's not saying, well, I'm bragging on him because he's never sinned. But he eschewed evil. And what does eschew evil mean? It means that he ran from evil. Do you know that when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're running from evil? Because you're running towards God, your Savior. And repentance is just a mere me turning away from the path I was on and turning towards God. I am eschewing evil. Now, can I, can I make a declaration and say, I'm not going to do this anymore. This sin is in my life and I, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to do the best I can. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But positionally is what I'm going after today. Positionally, who you and I are in God's eyes, the way God views us, not the way we view God views us, the way God views us, period. Not the way I think God thinks about me today, because I always, that that thinking changes every single day with my behavior. Oh, I I prayed for an hour today. God is really happy with me. I'm looking for a blessing. You know? That's how we think. You know? Oh, I didn't do what I was supposed to do as a Christian today. I chose the couch instead of church. God's not happy with me. That's how we think that God thinks. As our behavior has nothing to do with that. It doesn't change the fact that we are the apple of his eyes. And he brings us to a banqueting house, and his banner, his declaration over you and over me is love. That's the starting point, is love. I love you. You're mine. I have encircled you. I, I don't know if I shared it, but I was reading this book about, it's called The Circle Maker. And has anybody read it, The Circle Maker? Yeah, but it's about prayer. And it's about, uh, it really starts off about this guy who made a circle in the sand. There was a prophet in the first uh, century BC. And, and he stood in a circle and hadn't reigned in Jerusalem for two years. And uh, this guy, they called upon him because he was the old sage and the believer in God. And they, they had given up even looking for miracles anymore because it had been so long since a miracle was done in their land. And this guy, they said, what are you going to do? You know, it hasn't rained. We need rain. So he came in the middle of the square and he stood and he, and he had his cane, his walking stick, and, and he started walking around the circle. He drew a circle in the sand a couple, two, three times. And he stood in the circle and he said to God, I'm not leaving this circle till it rains. I 
<clears throat> I'm making a declaration, a vow to you, that I will not leave this circle till it rains. You say, wow, how long did he have to wait? One minute. Wow. This, is, this is recorded. One minute it started raining because he made that declaration. Wow. But he wasn't happy with that. He said, no, I don't want it just to rain. I want it to rain the power of God. And, the, and then it started coming down like a del, del, deluge, right? Yeah. And, and pouring, cats and dogs, if you will. And, and he says, no, no, I want it to rain the gentleness and grace of God upon this people. And the rain changed into a steady, peaceful rain for hours, right? Because he drew us... The point of it was he drew the circle and made that declaration. And there's a point of prayer of, of us not giving up on prayer until the answer comes. Like Jacob, not letting go of God till you bless me, type thing. But I couldn't help but think as I've been reading this book how it's not so much that this guy did this and that was a unique idea because I really think that God has encircled us first. And you get the idea from God that he has put a circle like he did with Job around us when he says, you are mine and my banner over you is love. Right? And if then you start discovering all these verses and promises in the word of God where God has encircled us. In First Peter, there he's saying, I have kept, you are kept by my power. You're not kept by your behavior. You're not kept by how good of a Christian you are, how many times you go to church, how often you pray. You're not kept by good works. You're kept by my power. The fact that you're my child is you're my child because you're kept by my power. My power to save. My power to redeem. My power to send my son to the cross to die for you. You are kept by my power. It has nothing to do with your power. It's his power. We're kept by that. That should make us feel so relieved this morning. If we could actually get a hold of that in our lives, we would be set free from all the times we condemn ourselves over our behavior, from all the times we withdraw from God because we think He's angry at us, from all those times that we, we, we condemn our own selves and feel guilty and stop doing what God wants us to do because we don't feel worthy. Because we, for some reason, I have, to, I have to keep my salvation. No, I am kept by His power. It has to be His power that keeps me. Or else it doesn't work. And so, I'm kept by His power. And then, there's so many verses, but I picked these that over in, in Psalm 139, if you would, to turn there. Because I think this, this psalm shows how God has encircled us. And why can God encircle us like that? What, what do we think of when we think of being encircled? A, a, a complete circle. Right? There's, there's, there's a line. Of, of, I, I almost want to pull someone up here and show them. But I should have done that. That would have been a good illustration. Got a rope or something. But uh, there's a circle around you. And how do I get out of the circle? Uh, can I jump over it? No. Well, you can. You can try. But the fact that God has encircled you... Uh, we see in Psalm 139 here, it, it almost like we can't escape. We can't escape. Even if we want to. Because why? You are mine. You are mine. When I gave my heart to Jesus Christ and received him as my Lord and Savior, without even realizing it, God took ownership of my soul. And it, do, it doesn't matter if I, if I go out tomorrow and I, I commit a sin, that is against God. It doesn't matter if I blow it uh, seven times a day. If I get back up again, I am His. I am His. Just look what it says here. Uh, verse 1, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. O Lord, remember who David was. If you want to say, well, David, you know, David slew Goliath. David killed his Philistines all over the place. David was, David was an adulterer. David conspired to commit murder. David disobeyed God when he numbered the people. David had his moments of doubt and shame. David was a person like you and I. That's who he was. Right? But this is what David said of God. He said, Thou hast searched me and known me. And you and I, when we read that, uh, get a little scared. We don't want God searching us. Ain't the searchlight. 
You know, you know the movies, you see the big searchlight come on and they're looking for the, the bad guy. They put the lights on. And they, you know, I don't like the light and everything. This is how we think of this God. He's putting this searchlight on me to, to find out my deep, dark sins. And I don't want him to see it. You know, for whatever reason. Uh, that's not what it's talking about about God searching us. He's not searching us with the spotlight to reveal our sins. He's searching me. He investigates every part of me. That's because He cares about me. He wants to know, um, in verse 2, Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Um, like, if you guys got up, I said, stand up, God would be aware of it. If you sat back down again, He would be aware of it. Like, have you ever seen a parent, especially new parents, with their, uh, their first child? They're like, their eyes are on them. They got eyes everywhere. It's like, they're talking to you, but they're looking to see where their kid is, right? They're checking around the corner. If the kid disappears for two seconds, they want to know what's going on. Because they're so protective of that child. They know, they can sense when something's not right. They're aware of every movement, every action, and because of love, because they're, it's their they're, they're child. You are mine. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you. I am going to cover you. I'm going to make you safe. I will put a hedge around you. How, we're evil parents, as the Bible calls us, and how much do we spend time putting hedges around our children? Oh, I'm going to send them to this school because this is a better school and this other school that they could go to, no, there's not good stuff there, so I'll, I'll get a second job and send them to this school if I have to because I'm putting a hedge around my child because I love them so much. Oh, I'm going to make phone calls. I'm going to check up on them. I'm going to see what they're doing. And the kids, are, when they're teenagers, they're going to like, why are you always checking up on me? Right? And we, the, teen, the kids think, they're just doing it to catch me in something. Well... <laughs> Sort of. <laughs> but, because we want to make sure you're okay. No. But here's God. He knows our every movement. Not so He can catch us, but because He loves us. He knows my downsetting. He knows my uprising. He knows when I'm making a move. He's aware of what's going on in my life. This should make us feel so safe this morning. So secure. God is aware of what I'm doing. And again, if you're living in a bunch of sin, you're not going to like this too much. But if you're really thinking, well, how much does God love me to take the time to be aware that I'm driving now? To be aware that I'm about to get hit by a train. <laughs> I wasn't aware of how much he was aware of it until I was aware that his angels were there. But he's aware of, our, of, of everything we're doing because he loves us. Verse 3, thou can compass my, my path and my lying down, thou art acquainted with all my ways. He circles our path. He knows when we're sleeping. He's there when we're sleeping. He's there when we wake up. He's there when we're doing uh, the simplest things. He's involved in our lives. He is not a God who is like, okay, you got, you got saved, you're on your own, I hope you make it here, behave, I'll see you when I see you. No, that horrible parenting job, that would be. No, I'm involved. And like I said, you might not like it when you're a teenager to say, you're always checking up on me. But I'm invo they're involved because they love you and they care about you. How much more is your Heavenly Father? And it's never to catch you in an act of doing wrong. Why? Because Christ paid for that already at the cross. This is the finished work. The circle is the finished work. The circle is what God did at Calvary. Right? The work is finished. God's not interested in how many sins you're committing and what you're not doing for Him. He knows all about it already. Because it says, there is not a word in my tongue, but, oh Lord, you knowest it all together. Before I have, you know, do you ever try and say, well, what's the word I'm thinking of? And I, it's right on the tip of my tongue. God already knows what the word is. Before you thought about it in your brain, God knows the words you're going to say. He knows all about it. Doesn't interfere with it. Let you put your foot in your mouth all the time. You know, I say, God, why didn't you stop me from saying that? Free will. You know, I try to warn you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. 
be still and, and be silent before you speak. Think about what you're going to say. God gives us all those warnings in the Word of God. To listen to them to, to, to before I open my mouth because we are really masterful at opening our mouth and saying what's on our mind. Right? Especially if we've been wronged. Especially if someone's come against us. But then God says, but be still and know that I'm God. But God says, a soft answer will turn away wrath. Mm -hmm. But God says, let your words on earth be few. Be few. Think before you speak. This is God's wording, but most of the time we're just like, no, no, no. They're getting a piece of my mind right now. <laughs> and they get more than a piece. They get a couple of pieces. <laughs> and how mad you are. You give them the whole pie sometimes. <laughs> you know? Generosity does, is not uh, lacking when it comes to our anger on people. So, <clears throat> in verse 5, Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Verse 6, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain unto it. This knowledge that God is aware of everything in my life, and he understands my thought afar off, is knowledge that is too wonderful for me. It's something that I can't comprehend because when I try and comprehend it, I come up with the reason that is not the real reason. I come up with the reason that, well, he's doing that to catch me. He's doing that to expose me. He's doing that because he wants to show me what I am for what I am. And that's not the truth at all, according to the Word of God. It is too high for me to comprehend this in the natural. The only thing I can do is accept it. I don't, can't understand it. For the life of me, I can't understand why God would choose me. And you might say the same thing about you. Why God would choose us. Uh, and if you look at the children of Israel in the Old Testament, why God is who he was saying this to, a stiff-necked, rebellious people in the natural, yet God loved them. They were his. They belonged to him. They were the apple of his eye. And so are you and I because we received Christ, the gift of God, by the way, nothing to do with us, we just received it, and he declared this on us. And the moment you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you understand doctrine or understand anything what's going on, you become his, and he brings you to his banqueting house, and he puts a banner over you that's love. And you are in the finished work, and he has encircled you. He has encircled I. And this, this, in, this encirclement means that nobody can touch us. He that touches you touches the apple of his eye. And no weapon formed against you can prosper. They will be formed against you, but they won't prosper. And say, that's, that's where we get say, oh, I've had plenty of weapons formed against me. That's right. That's because you're a child of God. And now you have enemies. But they don't prosper. They can be formed all day long, but they won't prosper. That's a promise for you. And I had to grab today. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I don't understand why this attack is happening. I don't understand what's going on here, God. You said that no weapon formed against me was promised. Because I didn't say it wouldn't be formed. I just said it wouldn't prosper. So live in that promise that the weapons that are formed against you, and they will be, will not prosper, though. We have the victory. We will end up being more than conquerors. We will end up in God's arms. No man, no man can pluck us out of his hand. No man. Not even ourselves, because we're kept by his power. I don't even have the power to pluck myself out of his own hand. I don't have that power anymore, because I am kept by his power, and his power exceeds my power. And I have free will, yes, and I can choose my free will all day long and say, I'm not going to go to church, I'm not going to pray, I'm not going to talk to God, I'm mad at him. I know plenty of people that have had that before. You say, are you saved? Yes, I am, but I'm mad at God, I'm not talking to him right now. <laughs> Parents, you ever have a kid and say, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm moving out. Say, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I was like, oh, don't move out. But this is what kids do. And God's not surprised when we do that. But that doesn't change the fact that you're still His. It doesn't change the fact that you're kept by His power. And we are kept by the power of God. It has nothing to do with me. And this... This overwhelms me this morning. I hope it overwhelms you, this kind of love. This is the kind of love that the same woman in Song of Solomon said, this love makes me sick. It's so overwhelming and so powerful. I can't understand why he would do it, yet I love it. 
I love the fact that God loves me. I love the fact that I can't escape from God. I love the fact that when I learn that He's not looking to shine a light on my sin, but He's looking for me to walk with Him in love, and that His light brings a warmth. Have you ever heard the stories of people who have had near-death experiences? And what do they say? Almost every one of them says the light was incredibly loving. There was a light everywhere, and the light was love. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. But the, it's because the light is the love of God shining into us. And he goes on to say, Where can I go from thy spirit, or where shall I free, flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there, obviously. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. It's not if the devil makes your bed in hell. It's not if, if the world makes your bed in hell. It's when you make your bed in hell. When you decide, I'm going to live in the pit. I'm going back to the slime. I'm going on a sin binge like you wouldn't believe. And I don't care. Get mad at me, God. Get mad at me, Christians. Get mad at me. I don't care. I'm going to do it. This is free will at its best, right? I'm, I'm my old man. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to make my bed in hell. What are you going to say about that, God? And people have that attitude. And what does it say? I'm there. I'm there. You're going to make your bed in hell? Fine. I'm there. I'm there. How, where can I escape from God's presence? Is there a place I can go where God is not? You know? It's not that God's there looking at my sin. God's there waiting for me to come to Him again. God's there waiting for me to turn back to Him like the prodigal. But it's not like a place that I can go where God says, that's it, I'm done with them. No more. I don't even know where He is. Where did you get there? I don't know. God knows. We might not know, but God knows. He is aware of my downsitting and my uprising, even when that's made in hell. He's aware, not so He can point it out and make me feel guilty or condemn me, and I know, I know that our, the way we think this morning is going to say, oh, well, I'm just like throwing the grace on a little too heavy. Don't we have to be accountable for his sin? Uh, yes, God already said that. You reap what you sow. God said, don't do this. I, I've been reading the book of Jeremiah, and it's incredible how many warnings God gives his people. And how many times he says, listen, this is going to happen I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you, I'm begging you, don't go this way. And over and over it says, but you would not. You made up your own mind and you went after other gods. You went after your own lusts. You went after the things that you desired to do and you did not and would not listen to me. But I have a provision for you. Turn back to me. Turn back to me. And we said it the other night that, you know, um, I forget who said it we give credit to, but we're only like one thought from falling away from what we believe. Not, not believing anymore, falling away from what we believe. But we're also only one thought from coming back. And so many of us think that, well, I, I took that thought and I fell away, but now I have this hard road to get back. It's one thought. I want to be back with you, God. One thought. Right? And that's all it takes. One thought. Because God is there waiting. Because we're kept by His power. It has to be His power. It's not my power. You think you can work your way out of the pit of sin and get back on the good graces with God? When the payment was made, that's what it talks about in Hebrews, there remaineth no more sacrifice for your sin. Because Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. There's nothing more that I can do for that sacrifice, because I am kept by His power. There's no, there's no sacrifice of, of praying hard and, and getting on your knees and doing good for a year to make up for the bad you did. There's nothing but turning and going back to God and acknowledging I have sinned, but I'm back. But I'm back. And so, he goes on, and you could read this psalm, I would encourage you to read it a lot. <coughs> read it over and over again, but... I wanted to close with this. Is, uh, 
In Psalm 139, verse 17, it, it says, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I am awake, I am still with thee. <coughs> Same thoughts that he extended to David, he extends to you and I. And how precious are those thoughts! How many of us really honestly sit there and think, God has precious thoughts to me today. Uh, I love to think about what God is thinking about me today. If we could go around the room before we preach this message and say, what do you think God thinks about you today? About your life, your decisions, what you did this morning, how you got upset last night, how you did this. Uh, do you think God's pleased with you? Most of us would say, not really. Be, uh, being honest with you, Pastor, not really. I haven't been living good. I haven't been doing I don't read as much as I should. I don't pray as much as I should. All day long we do that. So, so, so do you think that God's thoughts towards you are precious? Precious? Well, I don't know if I can say that, Pastor. I don't know. We don't know. This is David. This is David the murderer saying this. David the adulterer. David the numberer. David the conspirator. David the one. Yes, David the, the giant slayer, David the one that was God's chosen king, but he was David, a man with like passions as you and I, a man with a sin nature, a man who had triumphs and had victories and had failures. Bad failures. But in his man says, how precious are your thoughts toward me? What makes David say that? Faith. Faith. He had the same understanding of God as you and I do. The word of God. What makes us able to say that? Faith. By sight, I'm a wreck, but by faith, God loves me. That's a precious thought today. By sight, I don't know what I'm doing, but by faith, I'm more than a conqueror. That's a precious thought today. By faith, I'm kept by His power. That's a, this, show me the proof. I can't, but I have faith in that promise from God. That's a precious thought today. The, the Word of God becomes a precious thought to me today because it's His Word and it's kept by His power. Just as the world, everything in the world in Hebrews 1.3 is kept by His power. By the Word of His power. The whole world is kept together. And so my belief, what God thinks about me, the precious thoughts He has towards me is not based on what I did or didn't do. It's based on His power. His power to redeem, to buy me back, to possess me, to pay for those sins, to pay for all of it, and to be able to look at me as perfect, which we have talked about many times, none of us are able to do. None of us are able to declare, say, how many people here today are perfect? Nobody raises their hand, not even me. No, I'm not perfect. I'm pretty good, but I'm not perfect. You know, I have my good days. You know, try hard, all this stuff. But God says, no, you are precious in my sight. And since, it says in Isaiah 43, I think, still continue on in Psalm chapter 91, since you are precious in my sight, I have set my love upon you. And actually, Psalm 91 says, since you set your love upon me, you became precious in my sight. You say, so I could say to you this morning, are you perfect? No. Do you think God's thinking precious thoughts to you? Not really. I hope he does. Not really. All right. Do you love him? <laughs> yes, pastor. I love God. All of us, probably all are here. But do you love God today? Yeah, I love God. What do you think I'm here for? The food? Well, yeah, the food. <laughs> I love God, too, and I love food, too. I love God. Well, because you love God, you are precious to him. Because you've chosen God, he has made you the apple of his eye. And he has secured you, and he has put a hedge about you, and he has encircled you with all those things. And he does know everything that's going on about you because he cares about you, not because he's trying to catch you, but because he has encircled you. And in that circle, he's not letting you out. He's not letting you take yourself out of it. He's not letting anybody come in and get you. And if you get attacked, if you get uh, persecuted, if affliction comes upon you, then God has to give permission for it to happen. That is unbelievable comfort to me today. That God, just like Job, had, Satan had to get permission from God to go after Job. 
Satan had to get per uh, permission to go after Peter. Peter, Satan has desired you. How did Jesus know that? God told him. Satan is asking for Peter. He, what is he doing? He's asking for Peter. Oh, you just can't go after him? No, he has to ask me. He has to ask me. No one can, nothing can happen to you or I unless permission is given. And so you say, wow, so God is upset with me because the stuff that's happening is pretty bad. No, no. What did we say the other night? In the day of prosperity, rejoice. In the day of adversity, consider. Not complain, consider. Consider, why is this adversity happening? I'm going forward for God, adversity is going to happen. God wants to show me something, adversity is going to happen. I learn more about grace, love, forgiveness, His kindness, His gentleness, His compassion, when adversity is in my life, than I'll ever learn sitting on top of a mountaintop. Yeah. Ever. It's just a fact. It's just how we learn. So, 